Good morning. Mr. President, Shimon Peres, it is really a great honor to have you back with us in Davos. I would say you are a member of the community. Thank you. And this year is particularly special because the meeting here is uh, at the culmination of your remarkable seven years of presidency of Israel, which has been so important for your country, the region, and the world. Nationally, you have worked on, on and led many pivotal social causes, inclusive, including for improved protection and living conditions of asylum seekers in Israel, as well as the situation of many citizens. I could go on, and I have here a whole list of what you have done for your country. I just can say it's remarkable. And at the end of uh, this meeting, I will have the great honor to um, give you an award. And actually, it never happens in Davos that we have uh, an award ceremony, but you are so special as a global role model, as a symbol for someone with, with conviction that we will make not only an exception, we will make a very cherished exception. Thank you. And for me, Shimon, if I may say so, you always have been a great mentor. We know each other since so many years. You have been a supporter of our cause, improving the state of the world. So thank you for being here. But before I have the pleasure to, to, to hand over this award as a uh, reminder of, of your time in, in Davos, and of course we hope that you will join us for many, many more years, I would like to use this opportunity to ask you some questions. And first, of course, I would like to, to, to come back um, to the session yesterday, and in the best spirit of the dialogue which we have in Davos, um, in your judgment, uh, Mr. President, is Iran serious when it says it has no interest in building nuclear weapons? It would be serious if they wouldn't build nuclear weapons. But just by saying, that's not serious. Iran doesn't need the five, the five plus one to stop the nuclear story. For example, nobody forces Iran to build nuclear uh, missiles. What for? Doesn't have any use. Nobody forces Iran, for example, to support Hezbollah, which is today the greatest killer in Syria. They don't need anybody. Nobody has to force Iran to spend so much money on the nuclear capacities. So, I mean, uh, for the time being, it's half his story. You know, in every speech there are two parts. The one you declare, and the other that you omit. Occasionally, the part that you omit is more important than the part that you announce. And you ask the, the president, very simple, look, if you are for peace with all, does this include all countries? And you got a smile. It's nice, but it's not an answer. I think they have to. I don't think they reach this point out of choice, but also out of uh, pressure. And I think there may be another pressure that we are not aware of, and that is of the young generation in Iran itself. For us, Iran is not an enemy. We don't want to fight. We are not historically hostile. We don't have a common border. And we don't see any reason why, again, spend so much money on hatred on, and in the name of religion. So the declaration was so promising and the omission was so obvious that I don't have a better answer to outline the contradiction between the two. We know there are still many differences uh, in approaches, and, but let's hope that uh, this joint presence in, in Davos 
maybe in the long term may lead to uh, more positive results in the relations of Iran with the world and particularly also with Israel. You know, I asked the clerk from South Africa, how come? He stood, he was also under sanctions. He says when sanctions were declared against South Africa, the South African thought they can take it. They had enough money, they weren't worried. But then they discovered something they didn't focus. All of a sudden, they were boycotted by the rest of the world. They weren't invited to football games. They weren't invited to Olympics. They weren't invited to any place. All of a sudden, they felt alone. If Iran will continue to do what they are doing, then automatically, I believe, in addition to the sanctions, they will see that the world doesn't like this sort of bluffs, which are so dangerous. Mr. President, I, I remember when I visited you in 1903 in your office and you encouraged us so much to provide a platform for Palestinian-Israeli relations and reconciliation. And we had many, many successes, semi-successes, and maybe even more disappointments. Now we have embarked as a forum again with your blessing into the break the impasse uh, initiative and so I would be very interested to hear from you is there hope for a breakthrough in the peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians and the tremendous efforts Secretary Kerry whom we will see this afternoon is undertaking. You said we had uh, many successes and many failures it's right why do we have so many? Because we have many fronts. Would it be just one single confrontation? We would solve it. But since we have seven or eight or nine, so two were solved with Egypt and Jordan, very much with the help of uh, Davos. The first, uh, you shouldn't forget, and I shall never forget, the first fantastic conference in Casablanca. Yeah. There were 4,000 Arabs and Jews for the first time came together under this organization. Now I believe that two solutions is already great. Before it, people didn't believe we should make peace with Egypt, we should make peace with Jordan. They were very skeptical. They didn't believe that we can start something with the Palestinians, we start. There are difficulties, but neither of us has an alternative in real terms. There is no single leader to this confrontation, but many different groups the Americans, the Europeans, the Arab League, many countries. So it's not simple. It's not one watch, it's many watches and many times. But all told, the present situation is killing the Arab world. The terror is, is tearing them to pieces. You know, there is no coherent country today. And Israel offers, in real terms, a sincere peace and we are ready to offer what we can. We are a typical Middle Eastern place. We have shown that you can make from a desert an economy. Shimon, um, here in, in, in this Congress hall this morning, uh, some discussions um, uh, are taking place uh, in a restricted group on, on, on Syria. Uh, particularly after uh, we had those discussions in, in Geneva earlier this week. But what is your own personal view on the situation uh, in Syria, on Syria? All the elements which exist today in Syria are not elements for solutions, but elements for confrontation. We have to discover a new element that may unite them. The new element is made of two parts, the younger generation, and science. Because uh, President Assad he says as a president, what sort of a president is he? He killed 140,000 people. 600,000 people are in hospitals without taking care of. Three million refugees, they don't know where to, to spend the night and what to have for breakfast. My God, is that a country? And uh, there is nobody inside that can make up its mind. 
There are terrorists, many of them. There are terrorists coming from Europe, even non-Arab Muslims. 5,000 Five apparently yes. from Europe. And uh, even beginning with Iran, why does Iran support them? Why does Iran send Hezbollah to kill? What for? Was, but I do believe that he reached, he overreached already the human capacity to continue like it. And the solution to Syria will come from within Syria. Syria because the outside parties are not looking for a solution. So they did one thing, and that's about the gas. When the Russians and the Americans agreed, it's an important achievement. But I do believe that finally, the young Arab generation will be solutions. And I suggest to everybody not to look at the Arab parties, even not to look about the Arab religion divisions, but to look to the ages. The young age of the Arab world is the solution to the Arab problem. And we and you, we can be of help. We cannot be the major player. And I think it will won't take so much time as we, we estimate. And there are two, I mean, it took them 15 years until they decided they don't want to announce. But there is no solution, no alternative. And I think also that America is today behaving rightly because President Obama says, tell me, I have been in Afghanistan, Afghanistan for 30 years. What did I do there? And I think we have to let them do it. And I think the Arab world must come in and support the new generation in Syria or a new generation in Syria to save the land. I, I can only support what you are saying and as a small contribution of uh, Hall Foundation, we have invited some Syrians, some young people uh, to be part of the conference. And when you talk uh, to our global shapers, to our young global leaders, they can, just cannot an, anymore understand that the global civilization is not anymore capable to deal with such a tragedy as we see it in Syria. And our hope is really the young generation. You know, it's, I want to make one remark about the global participation, which is interesting. You know, for many years they say America is in the Middle East for oil. America has an interest. America doesn't eat any more the oil of the Middle East. They have more oil than Saudi Arabia. So nobody can say that America is there for oil because there is no need for. Europe doesn't need oil either. You have your own supplies. And today, in a strange way, the democratic world is in the Middle East, not for interest, but for values. They want really to offer peace and freedom and seriousness. And I suggest not to be so pragmatic and cynical. The United States and Europe are fighting there to enable people to be free, to give women equal rights. They are today subjected. And if women will be discriminated, they won't save their people, won't save their nation. And science, particularly what's suffered here, can make poor, growing people. And that's what should be done. And we have to work together and take ourselves more seriously than we do. We are not just the business. We are humanity. Yeah. And global companies are based on goodwill, not on power. And people who are sitting here are willing to contribute. Many of them are giving back money. So I think we have to, say, to, to change our self-image too. We want to appear on one hand macho, on the other hand pragmatic. But who says to be much and pragmatic is such a great thing? Maybe to be kind and considerate is more satisfying in life. Maybe to help is more satisfying than to rule. Mr. President, it, it, it just reconfirms our, our philosophy. Today, you cannot anymore split your life into an economic side and a social side. 
I think you are one human being and you have to integrate both dimensions exactly into your so. life in, and as a, as a nation into your politics. Not only that, I think uh, we divided our life wrongly between the realistic, the reality, and between the virtuality, yeah. the imaginary. Now the latest uh, conclusions in science is it's one reality. Virtuality is part of our reality. The way we feel, the way we dream, the way we think is part of our real life. And by enlarging or matching reality and virtuality, every person has a greater capacity. They call it augmentation, to augment the capabilities of a human being, to make him stronger, more self-assured, more positive. This is a real strength. And by the way, it goes both for human being and material, because material too are beginning to pay a part in the internet. I think this, let's say, forward orientation, this curiosity for new things, new developments, is probably the secret of your youth, because you are, in my opinion, uh, you are the oldest uh, participant on paper, but in your mind you are one of the youngest participants. Now, uh, just... Uh, can, you, can, you, can you just tell us, with your visionary um, attitude to the world, what, what do you see as a major change happening at this moment? In, in the world? In, 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 let's say, in the scientific, technical, in, we, we, the meeting uh, is called the reshaping of the world, yeah. consequences for society. What is the biggest reshaping taking place which has consequences for society? Three things. One I mentioned, the extension of science by combining virtuality and reality which means a man can improve himself, both physically, intellectually, and mentally, and make himself stronger, deeper, and a better person for himself. It's a beginning and it's a sensational. I mean, the consequences of it are great. The second thing is, uh, Klaus, what you mentioned, the, the, this Davos, said that the greatest problem is today the gap between rich and poor. I think it's right, but what is being rich and what is being poor? You cannot judge by money. A person that has a lot of money is not necessarily a rich or happy person. Poverty stands from the intellectual, emotional and uh, gap. I mean, I think it's the end of foreign aid. I do not believe that foreign aid will be continued in the present way, namely giving money to poor people. Because the money doesn't reach the poor people, it reaches the rich people in the poor countries. And that creates corruption. What we can offer is science. And the gap stems from the wrong handling of the use of science. We invested our supreme science achievements in information, communication, entertainment. We ignore the most important things. We didn't invest in education. We didn't invest in health. We didn't invest in food. What we did, for example, in the way of communication, we took a huge computer that would hardly enter this room, and we made from him a smartphone by introducing a small uh, chip. It's a sensation. Otherwise, only the rich people would have computers. But when you make such a small computer, everybody can have it. The same goes with education. We can invest in education, technologies, communications, that will make it available to everybody. You know, if uh, a friend of mine asked me, what is the first step to help a child to escape poverty. I told him to teach him English. The minute that the Hebrew-speaking boy will begin to speak English, he is beginning to end poverty. Now about health. 
We are now building a second floor of agriculture, medical agriculture. Agriculture supplies us calories and food. Agriculture can supply us as well medical, medical. And it can be available to everybody. The poor people must have an equal entry to education, to health, and food. We can increase the food production 10 times. It doesn't cost so much money. And I think what, what I would recommend to the Davos conference is to make all important issues and drawing the same investment and intention of high tech. It's possible, it's available. I'm speaking from a country that has nothing and now is flourishing. And we are typically Middle East. And I think this is the way to go out. Not the distribution of money, but the distribution of knowledge. The new currency is knowledge, not money, not pennies. And it can be done, by the way, in small groups as well. Here, for example, we start something new. You know, two or three students at universities are making a small high-tech group. And they take say, two or three hundred dollars a loan. We provide them the infrastructure. There are already 13,000 companies like it in Israel. 13,000, 60,000 students. And they don't need the large companies. It's a new way to do it. And I would recommend to governments and companies, go to the universities. Don't go to see the great organizations. Go to see the great knowledge. And better visit a laboratory than to visit a bank. Because all the new things are not in the, pay, in the printing of money, but the introducing of ideas. So we have to change it. I think we are now reaching the second part of science, which is making it more humane. Not to enable the people to be richer in money, but to be the people richer in human capacity to overcome the old sins and old gaps. And I want to tell you, the people who are here had the COs. I think you are more serious than you think. I see many COEs are giving back money to their communities. I don't think that the manager of a CEO wants to go back home and this boy or girl will ask him, Father, did you do something, anything for us, or just uh, you're making money out of the poor? He says, no. I want to be a contributing person. And this is the new spirit. We have to improve our own vision, not to run it on a technological, realistic, pragmatic level, because nothing is just realistic or just pragmatic. A great deal is visionary and the great is virtually. Shimon, you, you are the great visionary, and, um, but before we, I have the great honor to, to hand you over this uh, special award, uh, I would like to ask you one question which uh, I'm very curious about. With uh, your use, and constitutionally, you come to an end of your presidency. What will you do afterwards, except coming back to Davos? Can you tell us? I'm going to, I'm going to work. I, mean, I don't think you need the official title to do anything. I think the problem in life is not what to be, but what to do. Suppose you'll have better food, so what? You will do better things, yes. That will be remembered. And, uh, you know, first of all, I, I have a great boss, Ben Gurion, used to tell me all experts are experts for things that did happen. You don't have experts for things that may happen. So he says, here I can find a job. What is going to happen? I'm not dealing with things that happened. <laughs> I'm all my life looking for things that may happen. And believe me, it's uh, really great. And uh, Ben Gurion himself, you know, he was crazy about science. Every time a scientist would come, on, come in, he would uh, 
show him the table. He says, can a table think? And uh, all of them says, no. He didn't, when we on forecast, the tables are beginning to think. We have now the internet of things. What does it mean? That a table or a refrigerator can compute in their own right. You put a sensor in them, and they will tell, uh, they will, won't ask the lady of the house, they will look at the, uh, the refrigerator. If it's empty, he will invite already all the food you need. He will arrange uh, your table and he arrange your car. It's a different world. But on top of it, if I would have to describe myself, I would say that I'm a dissatisfied optimist. <laughs> what I mean by it, you know, the Jewish people, when the people ask me, what is the greatest contribution of the Jewish people to the rest of the world? My answer is straightforward, dissatisfaction. <laughs> a good Jew cannot be satisfied with this, so I'm Jewish. But on the other hand, they must be a believer. So I am a dissatisfied optimist. I have never a sad moment because I believe. I have never a happy moment because I never achieved everything I wanted to. So I live in this great curiosity. And uh, let me tell you something. Don't spend so much time on vacation and entertainment. <laughs> the greatest entertainment and the greatest interest is in working, not in resting. And believe me, you are by, more, by far healthier than you think. And even more so, you have more talent that you estimate. You are only partly used. And I think if you will adopt this contradictory synthesis of being both dissatisfied with what exists and visionary about what can be done, you will be happier at the age of 150 years. Thank you. Shimon, can I? A great leader, in my definition, has first brains, and you have brains, as you have shown again. He has vision, he has a soul, and he has values. You have it. And he has a heart. And heart means passion and compassion. And you have shown it again. And in this spirit, and very exceptionally, because we have so many leaders always in Davos, but I have the great honor to give you an award, a Global Leadership Award. And actually, you get so many, you certainly get so many um, special medals and uh, whatsoever. So we felt we should do something special. And we have here... <laughs> Hey, you see a bell, and the text is to President Shimon Peres, a unique visionary and global statesman for tolling the bell of peace and harmony. your permission to take this bell, go around the Middle East and call the people <laughs> <laughs> for peace. And tell them the bell, I shall say, this bell is a product of the Israeli efforts. I'm the humble recipient of it, but we have to use it, not just to keep it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's do it.